The Campaign Against James Conley Up to the time of the guilty verdict, the Leo Frank case had warranted only a few minor mentions in the Times, and then only as a routine crime story. The paper matter-of-factly noted that Conley, quote, a Negro, end quote, had testified to helping Frank, quote, dispose of the girl's body after she had been killed by Frank, end quote. Frank's Jewishness was not mentioned, nor was, quote, anti-Semitism, end quote. But once enlisted by Marshall, Ox pursued the story with a vengeance, and in so doing, eviscerated all traces of objectivity. As Steve Oney writes, The Times articles, quote, read as if they'd originated from within the defense camp, which, in many instances, they had. On several occasions during this period, Ox essentially turned over his news columns to Frank's lawyers, printing lengthy interviews unmediated by any skepticism and unencumbered by a word from the other side. End quote. The Times most often referred to Conley as simply, quote, the Negro, end quote, while referring to the convicted murderer as, quote, Mr. Frank, end quote, never, ever, as, quote, the Jew, end quote. A sample of the invective the Times specifically applied to Conley betrayed a deep-seated hatred of his race, indistinguishable from that of the worst Southern hate mongers. The New York Times called James Conley, a, quote, wretched, degenerate Negro, end quote. A, quote, semi-intoxicated, lustful, improvident, and impecunious Negro, end quote. A, quote, drunken degenerate, end quote. A, quote, treacherous Negro, end quote. A, quote, drunken, obscene Negro jailbird, end quote. A, quote, lying, licentious, negro, jailbird, end quote, and, quote, unmoral, wretch, end quote. Frank's attorneys had, quote, free reign to recapitulate the entire affair from Frank's point of view, end quote. Luther Z. Rosser attacked, quote, the negro Conley, end quote, trumpeting what he called his, quote, criminal record, end quote while juxtaposing Frank's superior standing and prestige. He added, quote, As for Conley, it would have been impossible to pick out a Negro lower in the social scale. End quote. Not only did the Times' coverage insist on Frank's innocence, but it openly demanded that Georgia authorities try, quote, the Negro Conley, end quote, as the murderer. There could be no mistaking that Ox's New York Times was a full-fledged member of the defense team. And though Marshall had warned him against recklessly attacking the Georgia judicial system and broadly charging its citizens with, quote, anti-Semitism, end quote, the now-obsessed Ox retold the story as though that were all that mattered. In nearly 100 articles, Ox made sure that for the vast American public first hearing of the case, Frank's Jewishness would become the central focus. Further, Ox's Times became the New York power center for organizing financial support among the northern Jewish elite. Ox tasked his own executive and socially adept fiduciary, Louis Wiley, to orchestrate the fundraising campaign on Frank's behalf. Wiley appealed, wheeled, and dealed on Times letterhead, intimately interacting with Frank's top operatives. Unsupported Negroes The 1853 law was clear. Quote, Negro testimony is inadmissible against a free white person. End quote. The 1913 Georgia custom was just as clear and just as valid. Ox adapted, refined, validated, and reiterated that profoundly racist, quote, unsupported word, end quote, doctrine, trumpeting it to a grand daily national circulation of a quarter of a million. His sophisticated version even took it a step further. The acceptance of, quote, Negro testimony, end quote, by the white Georgia justice system in itself equaled, quote, anti-Semitism, end quote. 
The substance of said testimony was not, should not, and could not matter in the least. The, quote, Negro, end quote, mouth from which it emanated was all that mattered. The Times titled one section of a sprawling, quote, special, end quote, article, quote, convicted on Negro testimony, end quote, insisting that it was an inferior class of testimony notable for its inherent unreliability. The article made no mention of a separate and distinct category of, quote, Jewish testimony, end quote. Often, the Times simply reprinted the unedited, unchallenged racism of its readers. Frank, said one, was, quote, convicted on the perjured testimony of a superstitious, disturbed, ignorant Negro mind, end quote. Another wrote that Georgians were, quote, hypnotized with the tale of that debauched and drunken Negro, end quote. A Times correspondent actually interviewed Conley in his Atlanta jail cell, and his report was made to order for the Frank team. Conley was a, quote, heartless, brutal, greedy, literally a black monster, drunken, low-lived, end quote, and, quote, utterly worthless, end quote. Further, he was, quote, a black human animal, end quote, who, quote, growls like a hungry dog, end quote, quote, the incarnation of brutality, end quote. Despite these vicious insults, the reporter seemed compelled to relay a remarkable fact about his, quote, black monster, end quote. Quote, in the course of much more than an hour's talk, I found it impossible to get from him the slightest contradiction of the story he had told upon the witness stand. He did not hesitate at all at any time. He did not contradict himself. End quote. In one legal appeal, Georgia's Judge Ben H. Hill denied Frank a new trial, but the Times pointed out that the judge had once defended a Southern white woman from quote, Negro testimony, end quote, in a New York trial with the following closing argument. Quote, Out of a long familiarity with the Negro type and knowledge of the race, I tell you on my honor, as a Southern gentleman, that a Negro cannot be believed under any circumstances. End quote. The New York Times was not pointing this out in outraged objection to Judge Hill's obvious racism but upbraiding him for not applying the same racist standard in the Frank case. Judge Hill, of course, had no epiphany about the believability of blacks. His judicial actions affirming the verdict only proved that the evidence against Frank was so overwhelming as to render Conley's, quote, Negro testimony, end quote, unessential. One part of the Times' strategy was to solicit the opinions of pro-Frank, quote, experts, End quote, to expound on the fine points of white American jurisprudence. Always, their racism was unbridled. Quote, Under the heading, Five Against the Negro, Georgian Barry Benson was incredulous that the jury would deliberately exalt above five whites the word of this base, self-admitted Negro perjurer. I believe that the twelve jurymen are Southern enough, and white enough to believe in this exactly as I believe, end quote. Under the heading, quote, Negroes as Forgers, end quote, Frank's attorney and Times, quote, expert, end quote, W. M. Howard wrote that, having practiced law in a court that dealt, quote, almost entirely with Negro crimes, end quote, he was able to characterize the Fagan murder as being, quote, a very low order of cunning, End quote, as seen practiced among the, quote, beasts, end quote, and committed by someone of, quote, a low order of intelligence, end quote. Another New York Times article titled, quote, Where the White Man Rules, end quote, approvingly described Atlanta as a place, quote, where the white man fosters white supremacy with passionate resolve, end quote, and where tradition demands that, quote, fine distinctions, end quote, be made, quote, between the Negro and the white man, end quote.
Despite this barrage of calculated contempt directed at the very humanity of James Conley and his accursed race, he actually became one of the most extensively quoted black men in the history of the New York Times. Words attributed to the demonized factory sweeper appeared in greater volume and detail and occasioned deeper editorial analysis than the combined New York Times published words of prominent black leaders of that era, including Booker T. Washington, Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Marcus M. Garvey. When the Times ran low on its own racial poison, it reprinted that which it could find in other newspapers, such as this ludicrous opinion from the Jacksonville Times Union. Quote, the hanging of Leo Frank will be a greater disgrace to Georgia than all the lynchings that have occurred in that state. End quote. The Times reprinted an Atlanta Journal editorial that called Conley, quote, an irresponsible, drunken Negro, end quote, and that claimed his, quote, Negro testimony, end quote, would not have been accepted were it not for the seriousness of the crime and the victim's whiteness. As, quote, a Negro, end quote, he, quote, would not have been believed under other conditions, end quote. Frank's supporters attached, quote, great significance, end quote, to the journal's opinion, and, according to the Times, Frank, quote, was a happy man when he read the editorial, end quote. The Times reprinted a letter from, quote, a woman in Atlanta, end quote, who called Conley, quote, the little short, thick, yellowish Negro, end quote, who had a, quote, woolly head, end quote, contrasting the, quote, yellowish Negro, end quote, with the, quote, black Negro, end quote, described in the murder notes found beside the body. In reference to the lost silver mesh purse that Mary Fagan had with her when she left her home, the writer believed, quote, None but a Negro criminal would have been cruel enough to take such spoils. That was no white man's act. End quote. She decried the idea that the courts have condemned, quote, God's own chosen ones on a criminal Negro's word. End quote. The Times showcased comments from New York's Evening Mail that neatly expressed a very Nazi like public appeal to white racial unity which Frank was now making for his own exoneration. Quote, America, the melting pot of the nations, in which the blood of all Aryan Europe has been fused during the past two centuries, is witnessing a recrudescence of national and race prejudices in most menacing forms. These racial lines of cleavage threaten to split our people, which had almost been fused into a homogeneous unit inspired by the American ideal into a mixed conglomerate of nationalities and races upon which no great civilization can be built up. End quote. Many other Gentile-owned newspapers also opined on the case, though none as extensively as the Jewish-owned New York Times. All must be viewed with the knowledge of Albert Lasker's extraordinary influence over important advertisers, whose spending, no doubt, prejudiced the coverage of the case. As Frank's Lasker Marshall Ox media blitz spread throughout the American press, Georgians seethed with predictable anger. Steve Oney wrote, quote, The Times' behavior in the Frank case was stunning. They lost all objectivity. They published dozens of stories, most of them quoting sources only from the defense camp, and they ran six or seven major editorials a month attacking the prosecution. End quote. The Augusta G.A. Chronicle questioned the behemoth of the North. Quote, Why has the Times attempted to make so much out of the Frank case, when so many other men, white and black and of all creeds, have gone to the gallows in the South for crimes far less revolting than this, and whose guilt was no better established? End quote. The Chronicle would never get a satisfactory answer to that question, but the paper accurately reflected the growing disgust that white Southerners had for Leo Frank's new Yankee-driven campaign. In 
There are yet other scholars of the Frank case who appear oblivious to Ox's role in fanning the racial tensions that came to define the Frank case. Brandeis University's Robin Kahn studied the New York Times coverage and returns this astounding verdict. The, quote, New York Times should be commended for its coverage in the case. Though the Times strove for objectivity, one may feel, based on, end quote, my, quote, study, that, as regards Frank, the editor's biases held sway. It appears, however, that this is not the case. Rather, the Times and its readership's commitment to a fair, legally proper trial was the crux of the issue, and this formed the basis of their support for Leo Frank. End quote. The Jewish Press and Race Hate The New York Times, with its huge political footprint, merely led this very Jewish campaign, but by no means was it the only Jewish newspaper to propagandize the Frank affair. The Pittsburgh Jewish Criterion, Boston's Jewish Advocate, the St. Louis Jewish Voice, New York's Jewish Daily Forward, the Jewish-owned New York World, and Evening World, New York, and most prominently, the American Israelite, run by Adolf Ox's own brother-in-law, Leo Wise, joined the Frank campaign, all promoting Frank's innocence using anti-black invective. The January 21, 1915 issue of the American Israelite passed along this editorial from a recent issue of American Medicine. Quote, the sexual proclivities of even the normal Negro are thus well known, and yet the jury and the courts have placed implicit confidence in a Negro who is said to be a pervert. The crime is one which Negroes are prone to commit, and if a white man is guilty, he generally, if not always, shows signs of mental disturbance. End quote. Through the agency of this impressive phalanx of Jewish media forces, the Leo Frank case was successfully recast from a criminal prosecution to an international Jewish crusade. And, as Jews, they increased the pressure on the state of Georgia, James Conley, and the, quote, criminal race, end quote, to which he belonged. Abraham Kahan's Yiddish-language forward was the Bible to arriving Eastern European immigrants, helping the newcomers to get acclimated to the culture and system of mainstream America. It devoted page after page to the Leo Frank case. Kahan cultivated an unusual personal closeness to the convict that obliterated any trace of objectivity. Kahan was perfectly attuned to America's racist ethos and accomplished an amazing feat. He vehemently protested Frank's lynching while simultaneously reinforcing the most savage of anti-black canards for his immigrant readers. Quote, We wouldn't be awed if, at the site of Frank's murder yesterday, a picnic with music would be organized the following day with the crowd drinking, eating, singing, and dancing, and politicians giving speeches. But that is what took place only a short time ago in that same South where two Negroes were hanged. That was how the wild African tribes used to behave when they'd capture a foreigner and prepare him for roasting and eating. That's how all savages behave, and the southern savages are no different. End quote. That Leo Frank and his Jewish supporters wailed so publicly about the supposed violation of their civil rights, while so energetically advocating that black people be deprived of theirs, is the most ignored hypocrisy of the entire case. Blacks react. Blacks watched incredulously as the leaders of organized American Jewry mercilessly attacked both their civil rights and their very humanity in the name of, quote, justice, end quote, for a single Jew. New York Age editor and activist James Weldon Johnson, quote, Every effort is being made by the defense to saddle the murder on the colored man, Conley. Whether Frank murdered Mary Fagan or not, we do not know. 
but the mere fact that Conley did not long ago make his exit from this terrestrial sphere, via a chariot of fire, is convincing proof that he, at least, is not the man who committed the deed. End quote. Chicago's Defender editorially noted the bitter irony that Jews had claimed to be victims of white oppression, but nonetheless, quote, have found time to perpetuate the same offenses, end quote, against blacks. The Afro-American Ledger of Baltimore responded to a white paper suggestion that the South should, quote, blush, end quote, at the lynching of Leo Frank, concluding with a wry flourish. We do, quote, blush with shame over the barbarity of the South, but it is no special blush. Our faces have been suffused a half hundred times before this year. It does make a difference, doesn't it? Whose ox is gored? End quote. Next to that commentary, it reprinted an ever-so-brief two-paragraph article from a white Baltimore newspaper, quote, reporting, end quote, on the lynching of three black men for allegedly, quote, poisoning mules, end quote. The ledger noted that the article appeared in the same issue where several columns were dedicated to covering the lynching of, quote, Leo Frank, the Jew, end quote. But it takes Mrs. K.J. Bill's letter to the editor of the Chicago Defender to sum up the dominant black perspective. Quote, This American nation is truly a nation of hypocrites. Have they stopped to count how many innocent men, women, and children have been burned, shot, and lynched without being given a chance to deny their guilt? Even since Frank has been playing hide-and-seek in the courts, Many of my unfortunate race have been lynched without even a protest from our own leading men and women. I have kept up with this case simply because one of my race is implicated. Now, because of so many protests from all sources to save Frank, at last, just as I expected, they are going to shift the whole murder and everything connected with it on the poor Negro. End quote. Georgia Responds the Tom Watson Effect. Quote, we increased the disease. End quote. Albert Lasker. Thomas, Tom, E. Watson, was the strongest of those Georgia voices that took deadly aim at the media blitzkrieg from the North. A powerful personality in Georgia politics, he wrote and published a weekly newspaper he called The Jeffersonian, and a monthly titled Watson's Magazine. Many Jews have claimed that the influential Georgia populist and attorney stoked the flames of anti-Semitism throughout the trial, and many, like Frank's main attorney, Louis Marshall, laid blame for the lynching of Frank at Watson's doorstep. This is how Watson's role is typically characterized. Quote, While waiting for the grand jury to act, Thomas E. Watson, populist candidate for president, author and journalist, and rabid professional Southerner, proceeded in his newspapers to try, convict, and execute Leo Frank, Yankee Jew and employer of Dixie's white womanhood. End quote. Jewish historian Murray Friedman claimed that Frank's lawyers used their racist courtroom language, quote, rhetorically, end quote and only in response to Tom Watson's anti-Semitic rhetoric. And writer Harry Golden claimed that Watson, quote, was directly responsible for fomenting the only European-type pogrom against a Jewish community in the history of the United States, end quote. These and other writers, eager to reinforce an invented, quote, anti-Semitism, end quote, narrative, have simply misrepresented Watson's role in the Frank case. The fact is, the trial lasted from July 28th to August 26th, 1913, when Frank was sentenced to die. But Watson published his first words on the case on March 19th, 1914, seven months after Leo Frank had been convicted. And just in the 30 days before Watson's first commentary, the New York Times had printed 14 anti-black, racism-filled articles as part of Frank's, quote, 
Truth on the March, end quote, campaign. Not one article even remotely resembling objective journalism. Once involved, Watson's approach was at first almost entirely defensive. He simply reprinted the New York Times' most offensive claims about the trial and then corrected the record in strident defense of Georgia's, quote, honor, end quote. The aggressive post-trial campaign mounted by Frank's new public relations team and their astonishing disregard for the facts of the case fed Watson's indignation. Lasker himself assessed his efforts on Frank's behalf. We, quote, indicted the whole people of Georgia. Well, then, as was natural, in any group, you solidify. We put the whole state of Georgia on trial, and we did what is so often done. In the cure that we gave for the disease, we increased the disease. End quote. Watson reacted strongly to that attack on, quote, the whole people of Georgia, end quote. And his first comments in the Jeffersonian represented the Georgian people's growing disdain for Frank's new extra-legal, quote, cure, end quote. Quote, According to law and to uniform practice, Frank has had a fair trial and has been justly condemned. Where shall our murder cases be tried? Are the newspapers to do it? Are the pulpits to do it? If so, let us try all of them the same way. Let us not have one law for the rich and another for the poor. End quote. Soon, this rather mild indignation morphed into a vigorous counterinsurgency that struck a militant chord with white Georgians. Watson was not a mere ideologue. He was a lawyer of many years. He was 58 years old by this time, who was well acquainted with the fine points of both Georgia state law and the Frank case. His painstaking analysis of the trial evidence and strict attention to the official record punctuated with flourishes of common white man outrage, made him the unbossed champion of Georgia's virtue. By early 1914, the three Atlanta dailies had been bullied into a position favorable to Frank's cause. Once aggressive in their reportage and trial coverage, the city's newspapers now kept a fixed eye on their substantial Jewish advertisement revenues and no one could help but notice that not one of the dailies tendered a response to the northern assault on their state and its blatant misrepresentation of the trial record. The Atlanta media's curious new orientation seemed to many to coincide with a rumored flood of funds pouring into the state to be used on Frank's behalf. But there was one glaring exception to the Frank team's efforts to muzzle the local press. They were unable to control the unsparing rhetoric of Thomas E. Watson. They were completely confounded by Watson's dissection of every aspect of Mary Fagan's murder, and Georgians reveled in his weekly jousting with the big northern media combines. No one could deny that Watson expressively articulated the common white Georgians' resentment. Quote, Never before did any criminal who had exhausted in his own behalf every known right, privilege, and precedent of the law, resort to such a systematic and unprecedented crusade against civilized tribunals, orderly methods, and legally established results. Never before in the history of this country has any convicted criminal been given the freedom of the daily papers that Frank has enjoyed. End quote. Watson directly countered Frank's attempts to create, quote, anti-Semitism, end quote, out of whole cloth, by citing the, quote, rich Jews, end quote, as the major offenders. The owners of the New York World, the Pulitzers, and the New York Times' Adolf Ox. Watson, a decorated racist himself, could readily see through Leo Frank's Negro testimony as anti-Semitism ploy. Quote, the great point emphasized by, end quote, the Jewish papers, quote, is that a witness against Frank was a Negro. It seems that Negroes are good enough to kill our ballots, make our laws, hold office, sleep in our beds, eat at our tables, marry our daughters, 
and mongrelize the Anglo-Saxon race, but are not good enough to bear testimony against a rich Jew. End quote. Oni comments that for Watson, quote, The implicit racism of many of the defense's allies was, of course, a fat target. End quote. Astonished at the, quote, untold millions, end quote, expended in the state on Frank's behalf, Watson railed at the seemingly endless appeals process that taxed Georgia's budget and its patience. There is no doubt that Tom Watson's rhetoric ultimately targeted Jews who championed the cause of, quote, a Jew pervert, end quote. But Watson offered Georgians far more legitimate legal analysis than the transparent propaganda in which the Times's Adolf Ox trafficked. Watson quoted at length from the brief of evidence, the official trial summary that Frank's lawyers approved of without dispute, but that Frank's team was loath to touch. Georgians appreciated Watson's take on the case, which was the kind of analysis that Frank's team assiduously avoided. As Lasker and the New York Times had become the prosecutors, Watson took up the defense. He filled in gaps in the layman's legal understanding of points of order, trial rules, due process, and courtroom strategy. For example, of the bloody fingerprints found on the factory's basement door, Watson said, quote, Let me here remind the reader that Jim Conley, a state's witness, could have been required by Leo Frank's lawyers to make the imprint of his fingers while he was on the stand. And if these finger marks had resembled those made on the back door, Frank would have gone free and the Negro would have swung. End quote. Watson pinpointed the blunders of and the mishandling of the case by Frank's main attorneys, Luther Rosser and Reuben Arnold, and challenged them both to debate him in print, offering them as much space as they would require. But their shrinking from the offer, like Frank's refusal to confront Jim Conley, preferring to be heard only through a northern enemy's megaphone, only increased Watson's legend and momentum. He drew biblical parallels to the case that subtly brought Frank's Jewishness into question. Watson reminded the Jews that it was Frank himself who brought out his Jewishness at the trial, and no one else. And, quote, If the Jews are so rash as to identify the whole race with its worst member, what can they expect? Other races don't make that mistake. End quote. He asked, quote, why should Jews, and the Gentile champions of Leo Frank, virtually claim that the whole Hebrew race was struck at, when one convicted pervert and murderer was punished, as Mosaic law would have him punished? If all Jews are incapable of crime, why the Decalogue and Leviticus? End quote. After the lynching of Leo Frank, Watson was unapologetic. Quote, Leo Frank was put to death, in obedience to legal sentence, after his just conviction had been sustained by the highest courts. We couldn't allow rich Jews to reverse our supreme courts. We couldn't allow them to substitute Talmudic teaching for the penal code of Georgia. End quote. The nation's premier advertising mind, Albert Lasker, and newspaper magnate Adolf Ox had experience only in one-way messaging, and they were utterly unprepared for an actual two-way debate. And Leo Frank's team of propagandists and promoters ignored Watson at their own peril. Their absence from the exchange allowed Watson's commentary to hold sway in Georgia. Certainly, the Jewish assault on Georgia instigated and whipped up Watson's anti-Frank rhetoric, but Watson had been openly, profoundly, and violently racist for years and years. And during those years, according to Dr. Lindemann, Jewish merchants bought advertising space in Watson's paper, and Watson often praised the city's Jews and notably avoided calling attention to anti-populist sentiment among them. As an attorney, he once defended a Jewish defendant against murder charges, stating in his closing argument, quote, no Jew can do murder. End quote. 
Alongside his commentary on the Frank case, the Jeffersonian ran articles that defended Jews from what Watson saw as their oppressors, Catholics. In an article titled, quote, Won't the Roman Catholics ever quit persecuting the Jews? End quote. He railed at how the Catholics, quote, barbarously persecuted the kindred of Mary, the peaceable Jews. End quote. In the very same issue, his front page headline screamed, quote, Here come the Negro priests preaching in the South. The Italian Pope is after our niggers. End quote. Complete with a cartoon showing a virginal white woman in a confession booth alone with a burly black priest with his, quote, thick, woolly head, end quote. Quote, can you imagine, end quote, he asked, quote, a deadlier danger to morals, end quote. And Watson acknowledged, respected, and defended the Jews' claim to the Holy Land. At the very moment of Leo Frank's arrest for the murder of Mary Fagan in late April of 1913, Watson's Jeffersonian was demanding that white politicians remove blacks from all government positions, advocating lynching and referring to blacks as, quote, niggers, end quote, and, quote, coons, end quote. And, to top it off, he was an avid and open supporter of the Ku Klux Klan. According to the Journal of Negro History, quote, the black male fared even worse at the hands of Watson, who insisted on the frequent use of brute force to control Negroes and on flogging, if for no other reason than for their color and their smell. End quote. Yet, with full knowledge of Watson's racial bigotry, Jewish leaders of the B'nai B'rith sought his legal services to aid their embattled president offering him a $5,000 retainer. Atlanta Jews and Leo Frank himself understood and supported Watson's sentiments and sought his special skills as they geared up to lay the blame for Mary Fagan's murder on, quote, a Negro, end quote. Indeed, Watson's racism was indistinguishable from that of Adolf Ox at the New York Times, whose editorial spoke of the, quote, coon, end quote, quote, nigger, end quote, quote, darky, end quote, and, quote, mammy, end quote, in reference to America's black citizenry. As a populist leader of 20 years earlier, Watson had at least tried cross-racial political organizing. Speaking with white and black sharecroppers ensnared by the crop lean system, he had often argued, quote, you are kept apart that you may be separately fleeced of your earnings. You are made to hate each other because upon that hatred is rested the keystone of the arch of financial despotism which enslaves you both. End quote. Jews, on the other hand, had always, avidly and unwaveringly, espoused white supremacy for as long as they had resided in Dixie. A large proportion of their members were in the merchant class and among the prime economic beneficiaries of the sharecropping system. They vehemently rejected Watson's brand of populism. And Watson soon, quote, reformed, end quote, his racial views to align more closely with those of the people of the book. So when they sought their best legal weapon in defense of the accused B'nai B'rith leader, Watson was their man. He refused their offer, and that may help explain why he made no mention of the case until seven months after the trial. And what role did Tom Watson play in inciting the lynching, or, as Watson called it, the, quote, irregular execution, end quote, of Leo Frank? According to interviews conducted by one scholar, quote, The lynch mob that did kill Frank was composed of coldly determined men who had vowed to see that Frank died even before Watson's tirade began. It is ironically improbable that he influenced appreciably the actions of the ones who did put Frank to death. End quote. Anti-Semite or not, it is clear that Tom Watson's outrage was generated by his belief that Leo Frank was a sexual predator. The willingness of the international Jewish community to rally around Frank as a Jew, 
and ignore his sexual crimes against a Gentile child is what brought out Watson's ire. Just as the willingness of Georgia courts to accept, quote, Negro testimony, end quote, brought out the racism of Adolf Ox, the racism of attorneys Rosser and Arnold, and the racism of Leo Frank himself. After Frank's lynching in 1915, the entire state conservative ticket backed by Watson was elected. And according to scholar Mark Bauman, some Jewish businessmen in Atlanta actually, quote, participated within the conservative faction, end quote. Ironically, Frank's patron saint, Albert Lasker, acknowledged the wisdom of Watson's point of view. Quote, I made a great mistake. Georgia, which had kept it quiet, resented the pressure from outsiders. Yes. I want to make up to Georgia for what I did to them then, because there is where our greatest mistake was when we took and flashed this all over the country. End quote. In retrospect, he said, he would have told Ox and other pressmen, quote, we don't want you to print a word. We want you to tell this to people who have economic connections in Georgia and we want them to talk to the economic leaders of the South. We want them to go down to Washington and talk to them quietly as if nothing was going on. If we had done that, I think we would have saved the boy's life. But when we put this tremendous pressure on all of them, the state was indicted and there came a unanimous opinion in Georgia that he was guilty. So I handled it badly. We didn't understand the psychology. The boy was commuted and lynched. I got him lynched instead of hung. That is all that happened. End quote. Lasker ultimately conceded that Watson was, in his opinion, quote, a very brilliant man. End quote. Last, scholars like Harry Golden and Leonard Jinnerstein have intimated that Watson was motivated by greed after seeing that Leo Frank, quote, turned into the greatest sales bonanza in the Jeffersonian's history. End quote. If this is so, then Watson was the last aboard a long, long train that included many pro-Frank newspapers, like the New York Times and the Jewish Daily Forward. As shown, publisher Abraham Kahan took a special interest in Frank that seemed to have far more to do with his struggling paper circulation than with any righteous indignation at Frank's plight. Scholar Jason Schulman charged Gahan with exploiting the Frank case for cash profit. Quote, Gahan, seeing how much attention the Frank affair was receiving in the mainstream press, took advantage of the moment and devised a plan to Americanize his forward readers by simply mimicking the American press. Despite Gahan's efforts, if the forward readers did not buy the newspaper, all his efforts would have been in vain. But the Yiddish-speaking immigrants could not be satiated by news of the Frank affair. On August 19, 1915, just two days after Frank's murder, the forward announced its new circulation. 200,267. Almost a 50% increase from the pre-Frank affair figure. End quote. Kahan's biographer, Theodore, quote, Pollock correctly points out that this act of regional insanity contributed to the growth of the forward. End quote. In his exploitation of the Frank case, Kahan did with the forward what Tom Watson was charged with doing for his Jeffersonian newspaper. Leo Frank's Bumbling Private Eyes Quote, Nine-tenths of the private detectives, so-called, are the worst lot of blackmailing crooks and scoundrels that ever went unhanged. I am trying to cloak this business with an air of respectability and honesty, but it has been the stamping ground for the worst kind of crooks for so long that it is a hard job. End quote. William J. Burns, private detective hired by Leo Frank. Quote, Undoubtedly, someone interested in the, end quote, Leo Frank, quote, defense, employed dishonest detectives, end quote, ADL. As Leo Frank's retooled defense team propagandized the public on an unprecedented international scale, 
They pursued the legal track within Georgia's appellate court system in their campaign to save the prisoners a life. Several unsuccessful appeals in Georgia state courts served to delay his execution throughout 1913 and into a very eventful 1914. His New York-based public relations assault on Georgia was antagonistic enough, but Frank also employed other strategies that only added to his many legal woes. Part of his plan involved a radical re-examination of the most damaging trial evidence. So in March of 1914, Frank hired, quote, the greatest sleuth in the world, end quote, William J. Burns, to perform that delicate assignment. The Burns agency had first been employed early in the case, when Frank was arrested, but it soon withdrew, citing the surrounding legal and illegal chaos. But its withdrawal probably had more to do with the rather resolute conclusion drawn by Burns' head detective, C. W. Toby. When it was suggested by a reporter that he was trying to shield Frank from the police investigation, Toby responded, quote, That is absurd. From what I developed in my investigation, I am convinced that Frank is the guilty man. We were working on the theory that he was the murderer. End quote. Clearly, that investigative arrangement did not work out for Leo Frank. The Pinkerton Agency, which had also been employed by Frank, had fallen out of favor because its agent, Harry Scott, like Burns' agent, had come to believe that Frank was the lone murderer of Mary Fagan. But with the passing of a year since that initial engagement, Burns this time came himself, descending upon Atlanta, ready to employ any means necessary to exonerate Leo Frank of Mary Fagan's murder. Publicly, Frank and his friends feigned ignorance of Burns's role, and actually denied that they had any connection to him at all. Appearing to be running interference, the Atlanta Constitution assured its readers that, quote, Leo Frank knows nothing of the decision of Detective William J. Burns to investigate the Fagan murder. That is, he knows nothing except what he has learned from the newspapers. It is generally conceded that Burns will not be associated with the prisoner's defense. His investigation, it is said, will be conducted independently. As yet, he has not accepted employment at the hands of Frank or his friends, and it may be that he will not be employed by anyone. End quote. All this was subterfuge. Frank's posture suggests that he wanted to keep a safe distance from the activities he and his legal team knew Burns would be engaged in. But Burns himself let slip to the press that it was Frank's friends who had employed him. Albert Lasker told his biographer that when he contacted fellow Jew Adolf Ox of the New York Times, quote, His second suggestion to me was that I retain William Burns whom he had the greatest confidence in. Burns cost me $25,000 out of my own pocket. End quote. Pompous and self-aggrandizing, the celebrated private eye presented himself as a meticulous investigator of complex crimes. But unbeknownst to most, Burns brought with him to Atlanta fresh wounds to his reputation, inflicted by no less of a power than President William H. Taft. Taft had pardoned an Oregon man convicted of land theft because Burns was found to have rigged the jury, among other misdeeds. A few years before that, in 1908, Burns was involved in a San Francisco corruption case in which he was suspected of dynamiting several buildings to make it appear to be an act of a key figure in the case, the Jewish politico Abe Roif. Now, for a hefty $4,500 retainer, $100,000 in today's dollars, from Lasker, Burns would put his international, quote, expertise, end quote, to work in Atlanta on Leo Frank's behalf. The slapstick comedy troupe, Keystone Cops, was just beginning their silent movie career in 1914 but it would be no surprise if it were found that they were inspired by the comically inept William J. Burns detective agency. Burns could not have made a worse first impression. 
promising Atlantans that he would resolve the already solved crime and clear up the murder, quote, mystery, end quote, without delay. He called the Atlanta police, quote, stupid, end quote, and pointed out that the mayor himself had publicly called them, quote, incompetent, end quote. Quote, as a rule, end quote, he pompously and prophetically professed private detectives were a, quote, bunch of liars, crooks, and incapable asses masquerading under the bogus title of detective, end quote. And with those introductory remarks, the greatest of all detectives set about ferreting out the crime of the century. With Frank only weeks away from the gallows, Burns had precious few days to, quote, obtain evidence, end quote, that would convincingly and decisively exonerate his, quote, secret, end quote, client. While Frank's legal team was filing brief after brief seeking a new trial in every possible venue, Burns and his men were in the trenches, re-interviewing witnesses and tracking down, quote, new leads, end quote. And then something strange began to happen. Several of the trial witnesses who had been in the company of Burns came down with memory loss or changes of heart, claiming they were now ready to reverse their testimony if Frank were granted a new trial. And as these miracle retractions began to pile up, the scoop-hungry press fed off each, quote, revelation, end quote, making it appear that the conviction of Frank was not as airtight as had been presumed. At trial, the prosecution proved that Frank murdered Mary Fagan on the second floor, but the defense claimed Conley pushed her into the basement from the first floor and strangled her there, Astoundingly, Burns found a woman who claimed she was walking by the pencil factory at the exact time of the murder and heard, quote, the agonized pleading of the girl who was being tortured in the factory basement, end quote. And the woman could tell by the girl's voice that her attacker was not a white man, said she, quote, I thought some Negro was whipping or killing his wife. End quote. Or, curiously, quote, some Negro riot, end quote, was occurring. Burns found a pencil factory employee named Cora L. Lefew, who now claimed to have seen the strands of hair on the second floor machine and was certain they were not Mary's. Burns found another named Georgia Denham who claimed to have had a conversation with James Conley in which she asked him about stains on his shirt, the ones which were said to have instigated his arrest. Quote, the Negro, end quote, told her, and no one else, that the stains were not rust but blood, and that his nose had been bleeding. She also explained why she had withheld this damning information for over a year. She blamed city detectives who took her affidavit and then ignored it. Burns found a white Baptist preacher named C.B. Ragsdale, who swore that he had overheard, quote, two darkies, end quote, talking on the street and that one of them was James Conley, whom he heard confess to the crime. Burns found two prominent Jews who, all of a sudden, remembered that they had seen Frank on the street at exactly the time necessary to provide an alibi for him. Frank, all of a sudden, a full half year after his conviction, remembered seeing them as well. Burns found the mother of a factory employee who, exactly one year after the murder, remembered that she was actually in Frank's office when Mary Fagan arrived there and saw her leave as Frank remained in his office. One girl came forward claiming that Conley had made, quote, drunken advances, end quote, to her just a week before Mary Fagan's murder, in, quote, exactly the same spot, end quote, where the Frank lawyers claimed Conley killed Fagan. The same, quote, little factory girl, end quote, had earlier testified in court during Frank's trial, but had made no mention of the alleged incident. His legend amplified with every newspaper edition, 
and Burns succeeded in turning many of those evidentiary molehills into major mountains of doubt about the verdict in the public mind outside Georgia. To rank-and-file Georgians, it all had the stench of bribery, graft, and fraud, and rumors of such were rampant, and the local press seemed uncritically accepting of it all. Leo Frank I am not a pervert. Frank's lawyers believed that the jury was influenced as much by the unchallenged charges of Frank's sexual lewdness as by the murder evidence. Indeed, Frank himself believed that, quote, the charge of perversion made it impossible for me to get a fair trial, end quote. In order to achieve a full and lasting vindication, Burns would have to cleanse Frank of that charge. And if he could, in the same artful motion, apply it to James Conley, Burns would surely be worth every penny of his enormous fee. Thus, the Frank team strategy was to stress the act of rape in Mary Fagan's murder, and in so doing, the Frank team felt they could convince a predisposed white America that only a black man could be responsible for the brutal killing of this white girl. Dr. Stuart Rockoff concurs, quote, Frank's trial lawyers also relied upon the stereotype of the black rapist to argue that Conley was the one most likely guilty of the crime. They argued that due to the sexually violent nature of black men, Conley had to be the perpetrator of the crime. End quote. And here, Burns, using the high-profile forum provided by Adolf Ox's in New York Times, was especially creative. Under ludicrous headlines like, quote, Burns, besides clearing Frank, aims to fix 20 ripper crimes on Negro, end quote. The, quote, world's greatest detective, end quote, said that he would be able to prove that Conley was the serial murderer of 20 black women in the Atlanta area over the previous three years. He contended that notes left at the scenes of those murdered, quote, Negro girls, end quote, bore, quote, a marked resemblance, end quote, to those at the Mary Fagan murder scene. No proof beyond the famous sleuth's own unchallenged word was offered, and none was asked for. In fact, according to a recent article on the, quote, ripper, end quote, the only, quote, notes, end quote, allegedly left by the serial killer, materialized in March 1914 when firefighters found notes pinned to fireboxes around the city. The note's author promised to, quote, cut the throats of all Negro women, end quote, found on the streets after a certain hour of the night. The notes appeared a full three years after the murders began and, suspiciously, at the exact same moment that Burns had entered the Leo Frank case. On Frank's alleged perversion, Burns readily shared his expertise. Quote, Many perverts occupy high places in society and in business. It is not a difficult matter for me to locate one, however. Abnormality has its unfailing marks. Frank is a normal man. I am satisfied of this fact. End quote. He called in six physicians to examine Frank in one 24-hour period, among them, quote, specialists on nervous diseases, end quote. No medical specialists needed for the black man James Conley, however, whom Burns insisted had a, quote, perverted brain, end quote. And Frank's public relations team of confirmed eugenicists went to work pairing James Conley with the word, quote, pervert, end quote, at every opportunity. Attorney Reuben Arnold set the tone, reiterating that Conley was indeed, quote, bestial, end quote, and that, quote, to call him a pervert is to pay him a compliment, end quote. At trial, Frank's attorneys had mocked as, quote, prudish, end quote, those who raised questions about Frank's sexual improprieties. But now, when falsely applied to Conley, the defense treated such deviancy as a matter of national security. Yet another Frank lawyer insisted that to a black man, there was no prize, quote, above life itself, end quote, other than, quote, the privilege of debasing a white woman, end quote. But even as they ramped up their claims of perversion against James Conley, the higher-ups on the Frank team were secretly expressing real concerns about the sexual normalcy of their client, Leo Frank. 
PR team leader Albert Lasker's private view of Frank was harsh and disturbing. Quote, It was very hard for us to be fair to him. He, end quote, Frank, quote, impressed us as a sexual pervert. Now, he may not have been, or rather a homosexual or something like that, end quote. The us he was referring to are the two noted newspaper men who had joined Albert Lasker in his first meeting with Frank. The editor of the New York Evening Journal, Arthur Brisbane, and the editor of the Atlanta Georgian, Keats Speed, and the man whose very responsibility was to pin the pervert charge on James Conley, one William J. Burns. Keats Speed remembers the episode. Quote, And when we got out and started down the courthouse steps, Lasker hated him. He said, Well, I hope he, end quote, Leo Frank, quote, gets out. And when he gets out, I hope he slips on a banana peel and breaks his neck. End quote. None of this, of course, got beyond the private correspondences of those involved, but it raises serious concerns about why they dedicated so much time, effort, and money to the cause of a man they seem to all agree was a despicable character and very likely a murderer. The Miraculous Carter Letters William J. Burns's arrival appeared to revive Frank's chances for a new trial, but Burns had boastfully proclaimed that he would find the murderer, not simply exonerate Leo Frank. If the actual murderer were not apprehended and proved guilty, Frank would remain under suspicion in the public's mind. So, money man Albert Lasker wrote to Frank's attorney, Herbert Haas, on April 20, 1914, that Burns's fees would be in jeopardy unless he could provide some conclusive evidence of Frank's innocence, and if a confession by the murderer, other than Frank, could not be achieved, quote, it will hurt us and may do the case more harm than if he had not entered into it at all. In other words, in face of his promises to name the murderer, Unless he names him in such a way as to be direct proof, the people in the North are in the frame of mind where they will feel that they have been fooled, and it will hurt the case. I have seen many editorials along these lines, and I cannot begin to tell you the number of people who have spoken about it in this way. I note particularly the enormous bill that Burns is running up, $15,000 to $20,000. Believe me, my dear Mr. Haas, there is a limit to the money that can be raised. And unless Burns proves something direct, there is a limit that can be paid him. End quote. If William J. Burns detected anything in this case, it was the unsubtle message in Lasker's communique. Shortly thereafter, and perfectly on cue, Burns was able to announce his most important quote, find end quote, yet a set of letters he claimed were written by James Conley, while he was incarcerated at the Atlanta jail and addressed to a black female inmate named Annie Maud Carter. They were, the Frank team excitedly insisted, filled with, quote, proof, end quote, of Conley's, quote, perversion, end quote, showing him to be sexually, quote, abnormal, end quote, the very same terms widely applied to Leo Frank. Burns characterized the letters as both, quote, startling, end quote, and, quote, dreadful, end quote. Quote, They show beyond a peradventure of a doubt that Conley is an abnormal man, just the vile, degenerate creature that I have heretofore pictured him. They are full of the vilest, most abominable language dealing with Conley's lust. His perverted passion was aroused by her, and most of the letters are full of this vile stuff. It fills one with loathing disgust to even merely read them. They are the most nauseating things imaginable. End quote. The letters show, Frank quickly added, that Conley, quote, is a vile degenerate and practicer of unnatural crimes which the law of this state punishes by life imprisonment in its penitentiary. End quote. The explosive new, quote, documents, end quote, contained no Conley confession, yet proved beyond all doubt that he, and he alone, had murdered Mary Fagan. The so-called Carter letters had the added value of clearing up a misinterpreted feature of the murder notes 
found next to the body of Mary Fagan. The prosecutor had convinced the jury that the murder notes were the product of Leo Frank's mind, and not Conley's, because of the use of the words, quote, Negro, end quote, and, quote, did, end quote. When blacks would have used the words, quote, nigger, end quote, and, quote, done, end quote. The Carter letters showed Conley using both, quote, Negro, end quote, and, quote, did, end quote. And thus, they, quote, completely explode the argument of the state, end quote. Luther Rosser proclaimed, The discovery of the letters was indeed a miraculous stroke of good fortune for Leo Frank. Brimming with confidence, Leo Frank issued a public proclamation. Quote, I submit to the people of Atlanta that, end quote, Chief of Detectives Newport A., quote, Lanford's bluff has been called. He knows perfectly well that the charge of perversion against me was a cowardly lie. I now make this solemn declaration. I am not a pervert, nor an immoral man. These charges against me are a vicious mass of lies. End quote. But as the chest thumping seemed to signal a renewed hope for Frank, the woman who supposedly had received the correspondence, Annie Maud Carter, seemed to have disappeared. No one could question her about the letters or the circumstances of their appearance. The prosecutor, the press, the public, had only an affidavit attributed to her by Frank's defenders. Ms. Carter, it turns out, was in the custody of the William J. Burns Detective Agency in such an unusual arrangement that Judge Benjamin H. Hill would not accept the affidavit until she could be questioned by the court. He held Burns in contempt and gave him a deadline to produce his witness. Once Carter was brought back under court order, the backstory of the letters changed quite dramatically from the Frank team version. Conley had always denied writing the letters, and Carter, after first going along with the stunt, admitted that they were forged and that she had actually worked in an undercover capacity for William J. Burns. The Atlanta Constitution reported, quote, She told Judge Hill that she had been sent away from Atlanta under direction of Detectives Burns and, end quote, Dan, quote, Leon, and that, on one occasion, she had been supplied with $5 pocket money. Two attorneys appeared in court to represent the Negress. One, end quote, George Gordon, quote, stated to the court that he had been employed to represent the woman by Isaac Haas, end quote. Leo Frank's attorney. Carter claimed that, quote, she had not received any vulgar letters from Conley, and she did not believe him to be a degenerate, end quote. As Burns's jailhouse plant, Carter had indeed talked to Conley, quote, for three hours, end quote, and concluded that, quote, Conley is not a pervert, end quote. He gave her two or three letters, she admitted, but, quote, there was nothing vulgar in them, end quote. And contrary to a frank-placed rumor, she said Conley never confessed to her that he had murdered Mary Fagan. A clearly irritated Judge Hill had this exchange with Carter. Hill, quote, After you made the affidavit, who first suggested that you leave? End quote. Carter, quote, Mr. Burns and Mr. End quote, Dan, quote, Leon suggested that I leave. End quote. Hill, quote, why, end quote. Carter, quote, they said that I better go where I would not come in contact with the city detectives who would want me to make different statements, end quote. Hill, quote, had you turned over the letters to them, end quote. Carter, quote, I didn't see the letters until I got to New Orleans, end quote. Hill did not pursue that line of questioning, or at least the newspapers did not cover it. But Carter, who was supposed to have been the recipient of those letters while in that Atlanta jailhouse, claimed under oath that she did not see them until she was in another state altogether. Further, she identified Frank's attorneys, the Hosses, as having arranged the entire operation. It seems that Carter had served her time as a cleaning woman at the jail where, in the course of her duties, she had conversations with Conley. Carter made this association known to a Jewish Decatur Street pawnbroker named Jake Jacobs, 
and it was Jacobs who contacted the Frank team to suggest that they might take advantage of this woman's access to James Conley. Carter testified that Jacobs had given her some jewelry which she had in pawn and that he also had given her a suitcase, quote, before she would allow him to take her before William J. Burns for an interview, end quote. The apparent result of that inducement was her participation in the scheme. As Carter sat before Judge Hill, she unhesitatingly and specifically repudiated the initial false affidavit that had come out of those shady associations. When asked who supplied the letters, Burns, now on the defensive, pled ignorance. But Judge Hill probed. Question. Quote, Was that Dr. End quote, George quote, Wren? End quote. Answer. Quote, I don't know. It was a man about 25 or 26 years old. End quote. Question. Quote, he is the man who furnished you with the translation of these letters? End quote. Answer. Quote, he translated them for me, then Leonard Haas translated them. End quote. Question. Quote, when did you tell counsel for Frank about the notes? End quote. Answer. Quote, Two of them, Messrs. Leonard and Herbert Haas, were present when I got them. End quote. Then, quote, Wren interpreted the notes. End quote. Question. Quote, How long did you have them in your possession before they were interpreted? End quote. Answer. Quote, Two or three days. End quote. Question. Quote, Who gave them to you? End quote. Answer. Quote, C. W. Burke. End quote. Question. Quote, then Burke deserves the credit for this? End quote. Answer. Quote, yes. End quote. Burke, lo and behold, was a detective that worked out of the office of Governor John M. Slayton, who was the silent partner in the law firm of Luther Z. Rosser, Frank's attorney. It was later revealed during Burns's criminal trial that a veritable who's who of local Jewish leadership was present when the false affidavit was assigned to Annie Maud Carter. Rabbi David Marks led the group that included Isaac Haas, Isaac Schoen, B. Wildauer, J. O. Knight, Notary, and Otto Schwab, all of whom were assembled for the ceremony in the law offices of Herbert and Leonard Haas. What's more, the, quote, handwriting expert, end quote, who claimed the letters to be authentic, had been hired by Frank's secretive financier, Albert Lasker. That Burns himself was once an expert in counterfeiting for the United States Secret Service further discredits the whole episode. Solicitor Hugh Dorsey stated to the court that the so-called Carter letters were, quote, founded upon falsehood, end quote. Quote, the said Conley denies the authorship of said letters. The circumstances indicate that Jim Conley never wrote any such letters, and the state insists that the letters produced containing vulgar and obscene language and referring to indecent matters are forgeries, end quote. Even though Frank's lawyers could take it no further in the judicial arena, such lurid and sensational tripe was made to order for the Lasker campaign. The team continued to push the letters so as to complete their evidentiary triad of rape, black men, and white girls. Author Jeffrey Melnick, quote, what is most disturbing about the projections of black rapists as the only possible villains in the Mary Fagan murder case is that many of them were explicitly authored by Frank's attorneys, end quote. Burns's forged and fraudulent, quote, Carter letters, end quote, were, writers have said, quote, the missing piece in the defense claim that Conley, and not Frank, was responsible for the crime, end quote. A year later, Georgia's governor, John Slayton, would rely heavily on those forgeries to justify his commutation of Frank's death sentence. Burns was undaunted as he triumphantly but prematurely announced, quote, I have absolutely cleared Leo Frank of the charge of perversion, which was wholly responsible for his conviction, and I have also demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jim Conley is a pervert and was the murderer of little Mary Fagan. End quote. That statement, though, was aimed more at proving to his employers that he had fulfilled the terms of his lucrative contract than at providing a true assessment of the, quote, proof, end quote, 
he had gathered. The so-called Carter letters remain yet more proof of the lengths Leo Frank was willing to go to destroy James Conley's personhood, his reputation, and his race. The private correspondence between Atlanta and Chicago really told it all. Herbert Haas wrote to Albert Lasker on May 2, 1914, quote, The situation is worse today than it has ever been. It is desperate. All of us feel that the situation is hopeless. Unless the Supreme Court of the United States sustains the constitutional point, Frank is a doomed man. It is the belief of nearly all our friends that Burns's connection with the case has done us irretrievable damage. End quote. Be with us again next time when we present the next chapter of The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, Volume 3. The Leo Frank Case, The Lynching of a Guilty Man. Prepared by the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam, Chicago, Illinois. Copyright 2016 by Latimer Associates. All rights reserved. Published in audiobook form by the American Mercury, with permission of the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam. 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 Of the Nation of Islam.